Yes, thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I'll start with Maria. Maria, you've been in the field for 10 years. You've been in the game for 10 years. What does hyperhidrosis advocacy entail? Gosh, it entails a lot of things. Um, first and foremost, I would say it's building your platform. So creating a website, creating social media accounts, uh, creating an email newsletter. And then once you've got that set up, um, you have to seek out your audience. And so finding those people who are already on social media, um, doctors, dermatologists, nurses, and just really building your network of people whom you want to talk to. Um, depending on your skill set, you might have to learn how to create a website, how to update a website, um, how to create graphics for social media. It's a lot of moving pieces. Kristen? So. Yes. What do you think? What's your point? I agree. There's a lot of moving pieces. Actually, what kind of interested me about making my blog, like the actual page itself, was the process of creating a web page. I thought it was so fun. <laughs> um, I didn't know a lot, so I spent a lot of time talking to like IT and whatever, you know, just to find information on how to do certain little like things on your on your site. Um, but yes, I agree. Like especially today there's so many platforms like i just started a twitter and i have no idea what that even entails <laughs> so i'm asking other people for advice i'm like so what do i what is this about like i just don't know enough about everything and there's always something new so just keeping up with all that stuff is can be a lot of work <laughs> to me personally it's a lot of work that one we can agree from the jump it's a lot of work uh it takes time takes uh, blood, sweat, tears, everything. Uh, <clears throat> late, night, late nights, you have to make sure that uh, all your social media platforms are sharing the same information. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to release or you, you don't want to disseminate information that is uh, distorted because people are, going to, people are going to react to it differently and they may even want to question is this true or not? Uh, I've learned a lot from you, Maria. Uh, even though I may not say it, but on the background of the trenches, <laughs> <laughs> I'm out there reading everything. I, I follow a lot of what you do. Same thing with Kristen. I do the same because I want to give information that will be received. And if they are going to apply it in, in their lives, they are going to see that change. And I believe advocacy, it's all about, first and foremost, you as a leader, you're serving with your life. There is no way, fine, it can be debatable, but for someone who doesn't have hyperhidrosis, they may not advocate and even articulate some of these challenges compared to we, the people who live with it. So it's a mix of everything. And just like you said, Kristen, yes, I know uh, Twitter, that's another whole, that's another world for me. <laughs> but but uh, slowly I'm getting there, I'm getting there. So uh, back to Maria, 10 years, 10 years, I mean, that's a wealth of knowledge. And the reason why I wanted to uh, tag in Kristen is because I want for the two of us to learn from Maria. Maria as a wealth of knowledge within the, the 10 year frame there's a lot that she, uh, she, has, uh, she, she has achieved. There's a lot that she has faced. There are information concerning advocacy that she knows that we don't. And vice versa, Maria is also here to learn from us. So mm -hmm. Maria, the 10 year period, what are some of the challenges that you've faced in your advocacy? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is when I was trying to work with um, some pharmaceutical companies who are developing hyperhidrosis drugs. They've got several different things in the pipeline that are already FDA approved or they're currently in, in clinical trials, whether it's phase one, phase two, or phase three. And trying to work with some of those pharmaceutical companies, not all of them, has been difficult because they're telling me 
for example, you know, if you want to work with us, you either have to work with us as a patient or you have to work with us as an influencer. But for me, I'm, I'm both, right? I'm a hyperhidrosis patient, but I also do influencer work to try and help companies sell their products or recruit for clinical trials. So depending on which pharmaceutical company you're working with, they may have some stricter guidelines in their own company that they have to follow. So there's certain t companies that I have not been able to work with because they won't, they won't work with me how I would prefer to be categorized, if you will. Um, so that's been a little bit of a challenge. And then other companies, uh, non-pharmaceutical related, whether they're selling you know, over-the-counter products for excessive sweating or products that might make your life a little bit drier, um, a lot of companies look at the number of followers you have and they won't even entertain the idea of working with you if you don't have a certain number of followers. And to me, that I think that's sad because hyperhidrosis is such an, a niche audience, but our audience is very engaged. So if any one of us were to say, hey, I've tried this product personally, I've tested it over several weeks time and it's working really well for me, our audience is more likely to buy that product because they're, they want relief, right? So even if we have 500 followers, if we post something and then we get, you know, 50% engagement on that post, that will do a lot for companies trying to sell their products. You know, they say for every $5 you spend on an influencer, you make back, a, I think, a dollar or it's something like that. So it's well worth these companies' times to look for those micro-influencers who can help them drive revenue. Excellent. What are some of the challenges that you've faced in your advocacy? I think to um, go on Maria's point is the same thing. Is it has to do with, are you popular, right? How many followers do you have? And I think that's also what is challenging in advocating for hyperhidrosis is even in research, if it's not popular enough, they won't even spend the time or money to look into other treatments. Um, and that's why I think it's taken so long. I truly believe hyperhidrosis can be more manageable if there was more attention towards it. But again, having that attention means having more followers. A lot of us hide our sweat. Like that's a part of the, the, condition, the condition. So it's, it's kind of like a double-edged sword when you're trying to advocate, but you have all these people who also you know, are suffering in silence. And so there's a small, like she said, it's a small group of people, but the people that are a part of it are very engaged. And I think as a patient, the most frustrating thing was having to try hundreds of treatments and like spending that money and not knowing if it's going to work or not, not knowing how to use it. So having people like us out there who are already testing it, it just makes the process a little bit easier and more accessible to everybody. Up until 2018, in our country, here in Kenya, no one was talking about hyperhidrosis. No one was even advocating for it. And uh, the, the, the dermatologist that I consulted for the first time for hyperhidrosis treatment, and this, is in, uh, this was in 2017, that was the first time I consulted a medical practitioner, a specialist for hyperhidrosis treatment. And when we're engaging, he told me that there is a, a group that advocates for it, but according to the research that I did, no one was talking about it. So it took me, it took Martin to share his story so that he can encourage those living with this condition to even start doing the same, speaking out about it. And like I told Maria in our last uh, uh, video uh, conversation we had, and I think I said the same to you, Africans, we do not talk about our problems, especially health issues. We don't talk about it. So you have Martin speaking about hyperhidrosis. We have a whole entire Ministry of Health that is aware of hyperhidrosis, but same way other people from the outside looking in, hyperhidrosis, it's, it's an, an issue. So they would rather spend time with the other major comorbidities, comorbidities comor, uh, I don't know the word, is it comor, comorbidities? 
comorbidities. Yeah, comorbidities, yeah. Uh, oh, thank God. Because ah. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather uh, spend a lot of time and focus on the, the four major, you know, cancer, diabetes, heart issues, and so on and so forth. But they will spend little to no time on hyperhidrosis. And that, to me, I was disappointed, number one, because in a population of about 45 to 50 million people, we are looking at about 20 or even half of the population living with hyperhidrosis. And this uh, constitutes of both primary and secondary. So you can't say that hyperhidrosis is a non-issue, yet you have all these people living with it. Number one, only a few are aware of it as a medical condition. A vast majority, they don't know. A lot of things even play, uh, a lot of factors play in. For, for instance, uh, culture. There are people with the, who have maintained their culture that uh, if so-and-so is sweating excessively, there could be something maybe, uh, and this is where now the myths play in. Maybe he was bewitched by someone. A certain family didn't like them, they bewitched them. Uh, number two, maybe you touched some stuff which you are not supposed to touch when you're young. But since 2018, up to where we are today, there is indeed progress. Now people are being educated. People are receiving the information that I'm talking about, the credible information. Now they know that what they have, it's actually a medical condition. They were not bewitched. They are not crazy. They are not abnormal. It's a medical condition. The next step is treatment. A vast majority would expect the government to help them to provide the sub subsidized uh, topical treatments. They're expecting uh, a medical cover rather to adjust the current one that they have, the national cover, to include hyperhidrosis. You see, there's a lot of expectations which cannot be met within a day. So I have to advocate, I have to sit down with the stakeholders and let them, and explain to them why it's important to include hyperhidrosis into the national cover, why it's important to raise awareness on hyperhidrosis. And sometimes even by word of mouth is not enough. So you have to show images, you have to play videos and the outcome is still the same. I mean, they will tell you, we'll call you back or we'll schedule another meeting, but it's, it's still slow. I don't know, maybe at the back of their minds, it's still not important. That's why it's HAK, I, I work through the night to bring content, to bring different stories from different people so that they can understand. It's not just Martin alone. Someone from a different part of the country or even outside the African continent, they struggle with this condition. It's not just a Kenyan condition. I didn't just wake up in the morning and decided this is a condition I have and I'm the one who needs help, no. It's globally, if 365 million people struggle with sweat, you can imagine the number of people struggling with sweat right here in Kenya. And not just Kenya alone, but the African continent at large. And to your point, Martin, in terms of primary hyperhidrosis and secondary hyperhidrosis, I've ex I work in the ER in a hospital and I experienced a patient who had cancer but was taking steroid medication. And I noticed right when I went into the room, the patient had a fan directly at their face. And she just kept telling me about how much she was sweating. And she told me, she's like, I have this condition called hyperhidrosis because of my steroids. And I was like, oh, so do I. And so we were talking about it for some time. But in terms of like, the impact it has on somebody's life, the secondary is just as important as the primary. This person was struggling with cancer, having to take additional treatment that caused, you know, excessive sweating, unbearable excessive sweating, to the point where, you know, your quality of life just, you know, it becomes less because not only are you having to take on one condition, but yet another. 
and she had no idea about, you know, any topicals or any treatments or any resources. She was just told it was just a side effect of the medication, and essentially you just have to deal with it. But when you excessively sweat the way we do, you can't just deal with it. Like, there's just so much that goes into sweating that a lot of people do not recognize. I would agree with that. And I would also add too that, you know, hyperhidrosis hasn't been a mainstream conversation for a very long time yet. It's not like we're talking about diabetes or ulcerative colitis or, you know, any of the other myriad health conditions that people have. So there's, we don't have as deep of a, a library of knowledge. Um, it's, it's growing bit by bit every day, but you know, we're, we're kind of coming into the game a little bit late. Um, so, you know, we don't have access to as much funding um, to advance research. And another part of it, too, is that patients need to be involved in conversations with pharmaceutical companies and companies that are developing over-the-counter solutions as well. You know, talking to healthcare workers is super important, too, but really the people on the front lines who are having to deal with this day in and day out, they should be asking patients. Right, because... Like any, like most of the oral medications have like a drying effect, right? And sometimes like too much so that mm -hmm. there's no point in taking it. Like it's so unbearable to like just be congested or have that dry eye, dry mouth, whatever it is, that sometimes the side effects outweigh the benefits that it just right. becomes irrelevant to use. Uh, what do you think, um, what do you think has changed in terms of hyperhidrosis awareness. Maria, I'll start with you. What do you think has changed? I think uh, people are definitely starting to grow some confidence and come out of the woodwork to share their sweaty secret. Um, so just generating more conversation around it has changed. Um, you know, just seeing more uh, influencers, more people who are out in the public eye, um, organizations who help advance awareness and research, like the International Hyperhidrosis Society is a big one. Um, they're a global nonprofit dedicated to hyperhidrosis awareness and treatment. Um, and then just the different, uh, like, patient leader networks, um, like We Go Health or Clara Health. So there's a lot more organizations that are starting to help patients. Kristen? So Martin, I don't know if you know this, but I actually was a guest post on Maria's My Life as a Puddle. Um, and after that, it was, so to begin with, I started the, following the International Hyperhidrosis Society. And then I stumbled across Maria's profile. And there's a difference between having that information and having a face that you know, can speak to the experiences that we have. And so that made a really big difference in being able to see that um, and feel, you know, not alone, right? And you mentioned previously that sometimes there's all these like theories of like, maybe you were cursed. And growing up, I always blamed myself. I thought it was my fault. Like, what did I do wrong? What did I do to deserve this? You know, it, like in terms of processing what was happening to my body, I didn't have the tools or the knowledge to really understand what was going on. And so I often blamed myself. So I was like, maybe it's this that I did. And you nitpick every little thing that I was doing, thinking that I was responsible for my sweating. And even today, knowing that it's, you know, that it's something that I can't control is hard to accept. But at the same time, there's moments where I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have walked so fast to you know work or something i'm sweating now like oh why did i do that i already know that this is going to happen and so you're still constantly you know in that mindset of kind of blaming yourself so trying to learn how to get out of that but to your your point in terms of like change in awareness i think um adding faces to the actual experiences you know has really made a difference because then you, you see like this is real. And I have friends that I've known my entire life that were just like, I just didn't realize. And it's like, yeah, I mean, this, this happens. But I think it's hard too for people to understand our reality. Because I've had people even say, well, maybe it's this, maybe you shouldn't do this. And it's like, I, we've tried it all. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
you know, we've eliminated so many things out of our life. I've tried like wearing different clothes, eating different things, meditating. And although some things obviously help, it doesn't, you know, it's not the root cause of what's going on. How would you describe um, hyperhidrosis awareness in uh, institutions of learning from kindergarten all the way to university, campus levels? How would you describe hyperhidrosis awareness? Maria? Um, as far as like explaining it to someone else during those stages or how, how do you mean? Um, is there, is there... Or like how, how aware I was during those stages? Yes, during those stages and now currently. Uh, is hyperhidrosis still talked about in institutions of learning and uh, how how do um, how do I put it? The students, the young students, how those who have hyperhidrosis, how are they managed in schools? How are they managed? I would yeah, I would say uh, elementary school. You know, the school nurse is probably the best resource for helping students manage their hyperhidrosis. But kids are so young at that time that they don't know what this thing is you know i just had really sweaty hands and feet all the time but i didn't know that i didn't really know to ask for help um or to say you know hey i'm, I'm having trouble writing on my paper you know is there something that can help me and then when i was about 12 and in middle school i finally asked my mom you know why are my hands always so sweaty what's wrong with my feet i can't wear you know sandals i can't wear jelly shoes because my feet will slip and slide around in them so then my mom took me to our primary care physician and he prescribed a topical antiperspirant, a prescription antiperspirant. Um, and that didn't really help me very much. He told me to apply it at, at night and to wrap my hands and feet in plastic wrap to help it absorb. Well, that's not conducive to a 12 year old. So I, you know, it didn't work for me, obviously. And then when I got into college, um, I started doing my own internet research and that was when I came across the term hy hyperhidrosis. So I actually gave a speech about hyperhidrosis in my public speaking class. So I was able to educate my fellow classmates at the same time. And now as an adult, um, you know, it's definitely talked about more. I myself talk about it all the time. Uh, so people in my immediate circle know what it is that I have and they know how to help me just, you know, little tips and tricks like, turning the fan on at their house or turning the air conditioning down or having a towel nearby if I'm going to be holding their baby, little things like that, that really help me to manage my condition. Kristen, campus so, life, how was so, it? Well, in middle school, I think there's like an age where like you just don't know that it's even a problem. And, and you're fr I had friends that like when I was going to church in school in middle school, like I had like my two designated friends that would stand by me in church and hold my hand. And it wasn't even a discussion. It was just a comfort level. They knew my hands sweat, just very matter of fact. And then like puberty hits and I'm just like an emotional mess. Everything's terrible. I hated my life. And in like sixth, seventh grade, I would actually, I wouldn't leave the house with them, but in school I would wear mittens. I live in Southern California and majority of the time it's 75 degrees. Like that's average. So I was wearing mittens in junior high school to class and I had a professor once that told me to take my gloves off and I was like, why? <laughs> and he's like, why do you have your, he just thought it was so weird. Why do you have your gloves on? What's going on? And I was like, I just like them on. I just like them on. And he made me take them off in front of the entire class. And I was more like obviously I still remember remember it. it was like I was mortified it was such a terrible experience but he still didn't understand and I was just like I just like to wear mittens my hands are cold like I couldn't even say what was going on um but in that respect I think in schools not just the nurses but just you know teachers obviously are the ones that spend the most time with the students so just being aware of you know I'm pretty sure there's probably teachers that walk by my classroom and saw like a puddle of sweat I don't know maybe I just hit it that well that's the other thing. I don't know. I was always hiding it. So <laughs> it's kind of hard, I think, as a kid, like she said, to really maybe point that out because you just don't really know what's going on. Um, but then going into to college, 
it became so much more than sweating. You know, I couldn't focus in class. It ultimately became, I couldn't focus in class. I couldn't focus during exams because in college, you know, a lot of the, the lecture halls have, you know, the chairs are right on top of each other. So I felt extremely claustrophobic and like everyone can see it. I felt super exposed. So during, you know, even lecture, I, I wasn't even focusing on the class. I was just like, okay, wipe, wipe, wipe my hand, make sure the person next to me didn't see me wiping my hand. Um, and again, like even in college, I didn't realize, or I didn't want to believe that it was a problem until I was doing poor in classes. And one of my professors, my senior year in college was like, hey, what's going on? And it was the second time taking a bio class because the first time I, I dropped it. And the second time taking it, and I was still doing bad, and it was one of those really large classes, and I, and she told me, she was just like, what is going on, like, during your test? And the first thing I thought of was, like, not the test. I'm thinking about my sweating. That's all I'm thinking about is my sweating. So in terms of, like, students, I, I didn't realize the impact it was having until someone actually noticed, like, hey, this person continues to do poor on exams or, or assignment, things like that. And at that point, that's when I was introduced to getting accommodations. So moving forward, when I had to retake classes, um, I've, I've now used accommodations um, to help me through that. My experiences were challenging. Uh, you know, you're growing up at home, you're the only one with, uh, with uh, excessive sweating. Uh, you attend school in a whole class you happen to be the only one with excessive sweating you can't your 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 uh, your classmate is as normal as possible you happen to be the only one so constantly i will tell myself there is something wrong with me that was the first thing i did there's something wrong with me the second thing I believed I was the only one with this condition in the whole world. So living through that, uh, the challenges of writing and uh, during exam time on how to mess my, question, my questionnaires and uh, writing pads with sweat paddles, all the way to high school and uh, college level when I was uh, doing my course in uh, graphic design I'm a creative, that's my profession. I'm a creative producer. I would mess my keyboard. My workstation would just be an ocean of sweat. So I had to come up with uh, decisive ways of dealing with this sweat because my, my lecturers at the time, they didn't understand why. Okay, according to them, they felt like, uh, are you anxious about your studies? Is there, is there something wrong with you? For them, they translated it to fear. You have that anxiety or because you, know, you, have, you have a class, you have to design stuff and you've been given time to accomplish a specific task. So of course, there's the combination of the normal anxiety and then now there's a hyperhidrosis. So it will be a mess be a serious mess. But one thing I realized in school, hyperhidrosis is not talked about. From kindergarten all the way to campus level, it's not talked about. This is why I believe that counseling is very important, especially for people living with hyperhidrosis. You go to school and you're in a class of about, give or take, a class of about 20 to 30 people and you're the only one with excessive sweating. And you're surrounded by 29 others who don't even understand your struggles, your, your everyday struggle, because it's not a day or a two month uh, struggle, it's an everyday struggle. You're surrounded by people who don't understand the things you go through, how this sweat has that impact, can impact your life more so in a negative way where you start preaching things to yourself. Why? Because you're surrounded by people who they don't understand. They don't want to sit down and just try and understand or even learn. But a vast majority, they just want to pick on you because now they have 
something that they can use to put you down. Counseling is very important because a lot of people have carried things that they have faced with this hyperhidrosis. It may not manifest at a younger age, but because they have bottled everything in, some of these things manifest in their old age. That's why you have suicide, uh, more, more people who are suicidal and you have all these suicidal cases which people don't want to talk about, people don't want to address. For someone to decide to take their own life, they didn't decide it two hours ago. No, it's a series of events. And this series started way back. Maybe they were five years old. You know, you may look at a five-year-old and you think, why? Why would this five-year-old be stressed by anything? They go to school and people say mean stuff. And then they come back home, they try to talk to you. But instead of listening to understand, you listen to reply. Mm -hmm. You do that repeatedly. What happens? I'll bottle everything in. And you know, we men, that's what we do. We don't like talking about our problems because... I mean, for it's hard for people to understand. So we'd rather deal with our own issues. Now here you have a five-year-old at a young age bottling everything in. When this person gets to a period where they're now a young adult, how many things have they bottled in? And it only takes one, just one incident to mess everything up. So my question to you is, how important is therapy and uh, counseling for school going children? How important? And is it something that we should push since we are advocates for hyperhidrosis? Is this something you would consider that we push counseling and uh, therapy in schools, institutions of learning? Maria, start with you. Yeah, I think it's definitely a topic worth talking about. Um, I've seen several therapists over the years, not necessarily for hyperhidrosis, but it, it always comes up in conversation at some point. Um, you know, the word therapy or therapist can be scary for a lot of people because like you said, they've been stuffing these feelings down for so long that to start talking about them and release them, you know, is scary and may, many people may not want to do that. But I think too, we come in as advocates and influencers is just encouraging those with hyperhidrosis to start using their sweaty voices. Even if they're not in a therapy setting with a counselor or a licensed professional, just having that community of people who are just like them and understand what it is that they're going through on a daily basis can be really empowering because once we find our community, you know, we don't feel as alone and then we can start to build that, that muscle of using our voice and, and asking for what we need and, and just finding comfort and support with each other because we were not created to be alone, we were created for community. So that's kind of a big focus for me now in my own advocacy work is no longer making it just about me and my stories, but opening it up for everyone to share their stories so that they can be empowered themselves to live a, a better life. Kristen? Yes, I've talked a lot about how positive therapy was for me. And in therapy, there is this one moment where I said, you know, I'm 30 years old, but I still feel like I'm seven years old emotionally. And with hyperhidrosis, I feel like I'm just that little girl that just is struggling, like just confused, alone, like all these emotions that I had as a kid, I still have, and they feel very real sometimes. And so when you bottle that up and you never let that go, I mean, of course, like it, it's going to, it's going to stay with you and it could have adverse effects over like the long term. And when you're talking about suicide, I mean, there's definitely points in, in my life where I was just like, I would rather have a terminal illness because at least I knew when it would be over and saying that out loud, like sounds maybe selfish or whatnot, but that was my thought. I was like, I'd rather have a terminal illness because then I would know when it would be over rather than living like this every single day of my life because it, it was miserable and some days it still is. So, you know, addressing the psychological impact it can have on somebody 
is extremely important. And I think we've all probably had people reach out to us on our platforms, just asking questions and having that is so amazing. I love it. Um, I think it, it, it just like, like Maria mentioned, like that sense of community that, you know, I think can really change somebody's perspective on their condition and, and give them that, that voice and confidence to talk about it. What do you think is uh, holding us back as advocates for hyperhidrosis? I'll start with Ma Maria. You've been in the game for, for 10 years. What do you think it's holding um, us back as advocates? For me, it's probably time and skill set. Um, you know, I work a full time job, um, I have a husband, I have family and friends that I like to hang out with. So it's a matter of balancing time. And then, um, you know, it, it costs money to run a website and have a custom URL. And, you know, if I wanted to spend money on like social media advertising, that costs money. Um, yeah, and then just the skill set wise, you know, I'm not the best at creating videos. Um, I don't know how to really edit videos. I don't have a fancy video camera or a DSLR camera. So everything I do is either on my phone or my iPad. So you now building up that skill set, I would love to do that in the future so I can have some higher quality video content. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, I, I do what I can and I don't try to stress myself out if I'm not writing a blog post every week or posting on social media X times, you know, a week. Um, cause I tend to be very perfectionistic and I, I, I care about the work that I do. So I want to produce quality content, but I also want to be able to have a healthy balance in life. So I try not to stress out too much about it. Kristen, what do you think is yeah. holding us back? Um, aside from everything Maria said, I mean, that's on point, right? I mean, it, it can be time consuming and when I started the blog I, or prior to that, I did a little bit of research and it has like, you're right. There's like this formula to like post something every so often. And I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> like, that's mm -hmm. way too much pressure. I just want to like say what I want to say or what others have to say without like, I don't care how many followers I have, you know, people are like, Oh, look how many followers. Like, I don't, that's not important to me. Like I'm here to advocate for hyperhidrosis, not for me. Um, I just happened to be, you know, Maria gave me that platform to, to use my voice. And I, I've kind of just taken that um, with my blog and just, you know, utilize the information we have to share that because I know how important it is for people who may not have access or have no idea what's going on with their body to just have a, a spot that they can go to and rely on for information. Um, and in terms of like holding us back for our advocacy, I think, you know, just again, trying to be popular um is is what kind of seems to be the uh, motivating force for researcher for people who for pharmaceuticals for products all that type of stuff so that can be kind of difficult when you're trying to be honest and genuine but yet you know if you want that awareness that we need we also need to maybe sometimes fake it and i don't want to do that like i don't want to stray away from what is true to us, you know? Um, so I think that's kind of like the, the balance between advocating and what others, you know, expect in terms of um, awareness. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it is time consuming. Uh, I sleep at around two or 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, working on videos, working on content. Uh, there is money involved especially when it comes to uh, web hosting, just like Maria said, is web hosting, uh, advertising when you have to boost a post on Facebook and you have to link it with Instagram and vice versa. Uh, for me, I think being a creative, I'm also a perfectionist. If it doesn't sound right or look good, I will not release it. And it's something that I've battled with for so long. One of my friends told me, listen, sometimes you just have to learn to just let it go. Because whatever you deem as not perfect, it's actually the most perfect piece that you're putting out there. 
it's most a people don't notice what we think is imperfect, right? Like we all have our little things. And so oh. like, I didn't even notice that. Like, how did you not notice that? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> like the same way, just, just like Maria. Maria said that, uh, you know, you don't have the best camera. You have a mobile phone and all that, which reminds me, I stumbled on your first video in 2017, which you recorded using your phone. Mm -hmm. You see how important yeah. the message. <laughs> what, what I think looks terrible reaches what? someone across the world. You know, that's so you're like, uh, you know, you're there with your phone, you know, I'm hi, my name is Maria, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, this is one shitty mm -mm, quality. <laughs> but, the, but here I am in Kenya, East Africa. I'm sitting there, I'm like, wow. She's advocating for hyperhidrosis. Oh, she has a blog. I'm on it. My life has a mm -hmm. part. So you see, I'm learning. And how did I stumble upon you was through a video you recorded on your phone. Yeah. So it's, it's something I'm trying to teach myself. You know, sometimes it doesn't have to be perfect, even though it's not easy. It's not easy mm -hmm. to let go something that you feel uh, it hasn't, it doesn't have that touch. There's a certain touch we go for. But uh, on the part of what's holding us back is, uh, I think, most of us are still, as advocates, we are still also on the gray area. There, 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 there is content or information we want to touch or even talk about, but we have these a million questions at the back of our minds. If I do this, I will lose sponsorships. If I talk about this, people will think I'm fighting the authority. If I do this, the hyperhidrosis family will think I'm trying to sell them out. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fight between ourselves and our minds and what we want to put out. And the legality of it too, like we're, we're putting exactly. information out and mm. if I'm promoting a product, you can only say certain things you know about it not you know and so it's just it, in terms of that it can be limiting because you want to say the truth but there are you know restrictions to that and then again right. uh there, there are, we have some of these topical treatment brands i've seen maria maria uses a lot of uh, copy see you i do yeah copy is your brand eh? Coffee, coffee, your <laughs> well, and that, that's the thing too. You know, I've had several over-the-counter companies approach me mm -hmm. and send me free products to test, you know, and then they want me to do a blog post or a social media post. Well, I will not endorse or talk about a product per se, unless I've tested it personally and I find that it works for me. If it's a product that doesn't work for me, I will not talk about it. Not, and that's not to say that that product doesn't work for someone else because each person's body is different. But if you just want to pay me to talk about a product, I'm not going to do that because it's not honest. It's not authentic. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, well, am I advocating in order to make money or am I advocating in order to help people? So I always go back to my original intention, which is helping people feel better about the skin that they're in. Right. Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, these topical treatments, we are supposed to give them a try. And we cannot say that a specific brand is the complete solution. We have all these other brands. So it's up to we, as people living in this condition, to give it a try. Kape worked for Maria. It's working for her. It may not be 100%, but whenever Maria uses Kape, she's able to go about her day-to-day -day duties, right? There is someone else who uses sweat block, and it works for them. Another one may use zero sweat. So we have all these brands. It's up to you now to do the research. Go look at the reviews. Get in touch with Maria. If you want to do, uh, if you want to go with Cape, you want to give Cape a try, talk to Maria. Maria is there. Maria has been using Cape. She mm -hmm. will gladly explain to you. But one thing that I know with all these topical treatments, they do not provide a cure or a permanent solution. So that, right. that's the first thing that we all should be putting out there. To everyone who wants to use these brands, it's not a complete solution. It's not a cure. 
for your excessive sweating, but it will help you manage your excessive sweating. I'm sure you want to drive your car, you want to use your smartphone, you want, there are things you want to do. This brand will, or rather this topical treatment will enable you to do one, two, three, right? So- Makes it a little bit easier. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And at any given time in your advocacy, uh, Maria, was there a time where you were quote unquote silenced for awareness? Where you wanted to say something, you wanted to articulate some of the challenges and uh, you're like, they try to silence you or try to direct you, you know, instead of putting your point, they just want to direct you to say it in a different way. Was there a time? Um, I can think of two examples. Um, one being, you know, I was trying to work with a certain pharmaceutical company and you know, I talked to some of their outreach people and didn't really feel like I made any headway with them. So then I went up the chain and I talked to the vice president and it was a really good conversation. But again, it kind of went back to just the way they and their, their culture operates. You know, they were trying to force me into one, one situation or another. You know, are you going to work with us as a patient? Or are you going to work with us as an advocate and an influencer? And there was no happy medium. So I felt like I couldn't really use my voice to advocate with them. Um, so that was a little frustrating. So, you know, if something doesn't feel right to me, I'm not going to keep putting energy toward it. So I just kind of let that relationship or lack thereof, you know, kind of go on the back burner. And then back in 2016, I kind of silenced myself for a little while. I didn't blog for probably, 10 months, if not longer. Um, I also have an autoimmune condition. It's called ulcerative colitis. It's an inflammatory bowel disease. I got very sick with, with my IBD um, and I was actually hospitalized for a weekend back in 2016. Um, and I became also very depressed and suicidal as a result of that. It had nothing to do with my hyperhidrosis, but I can certainly understand having suicidal thoughts because of hyperhidrosis. So. I had to take some time for me. I, I flew back home to Colorado and I lived with my parents for about 10 months, um, was in therapy once a week. I was on a couple of different antidepressants for about a year under the guidance of a psychologist. And so that was really my time to take care of myself because if we're not taking care of ourselves first and foremost, we're not going to have the energy to be able to advocate for other people who have this condition. Kristen. Yes. Have, you ever, have you ever been silenced for awareness? Um, not necessarily, but I feel like there is, even in, in advocating, there's that sense of, um, I don't want to be too much, because now that I'm doing that, there's instances in my life where I'm like, oh, I didn't realize this was like isolated hyperhidrosis, this would be good to talk about. But then the people I'm around are like, don't be on your phone, right? <laughs> so in that way, I feel like I don't want to be that person that's always on their phone. Like, oh, this is for content. This is for content. Yeah. But there are, so I'll just, if anything, I'll just write a note and like go back to it later when I have time for myself. But in terms of like, uh, you know, I haven't really had any other people silence me. It's just my own, you know, not wanting to be that person who's always on their phone or producing content. <laughs> Kristen, how do you deal with uh, trolls? Trolls? I haven't had any yet. Um, <laughs> oh, that's <but> that. <laughs> like, you have people who are like, well, maybe try, I actually did a post this morning about coffee, maybe try not drinking coffee. And I'm like, no, like, <laughs> sorry, but if it was that easy, like, I probably would have figured that out a long time ago. Um, but yeah, I, I thankfully have not experienced anything yet. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. Maybe you guys can tell me if and you have more. In an event, in an event, it happens. Because it will. It will. Mm -hmm. In an event, it happens. How, how would you deal with it as an advocate? How would you? Because you have to separate yourself mm -hmm. as Kristen. And Kristen, the advocate for hyperhidrosis. 
Well, I think I would do I would welcome a conversation about it mm -hmm. in hopes that it would go in a somewhat positive direction. I mean, I have no problem talking about it or the controversy or any opinions people have regarding it. Um, I think it would just, I don't know, like, I, I would just hope it wouldn't go in like the wrong direction where I'd have to be forced to be like, okay, I can't continue this conversation. So I think it's important to have these conversations. I think it's important to talk about, you know, maybe the misconception other people might have about it. Um, and that many people have different experiences. So not all of it is the same across the board. Um, but in the event that that did happen, I would hope to have listen to their opinion and have a conversation, be able to have a conversation about it. Maria. I, know, I haven't know. really had any trolls in the 10 years I've been doing this. I've been very fortunate in that respect. I have had PDM me on Instagram asking me for pictures of my sweaty feet. Like they're willing to pay me for pictures of my sweaty feet because I have a foot fetish and you know, that's fine to each his own, but I'm not going to be selling my body. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, you know, if I get comments, um, you know, just try and keep my responses kind, stick to the facts. And, you know, if it starts to get nasty, then just shut the conversation down and, and block that person if necessary. But really, the trolls, that's on them. That's not on me. You know, so I try not to take things too personally. Well, I've been trolled several times uh, since... Since 2018, since I launched the hyperhidrosis awareness, but last year, Maria, when did you share uh, Jess her story? The, when did you share her story? Was last year? Um. So she, her first guest post was in 2018, and then she helped me extensively last year for hyperhidrosis awareness month. Yeah, because there's a time. There was a time you shared uh, a video like a seven minute video, there were small videos and then you put them together. It was about mm -hmm. 20 minutes or so. So I shared, anytime you would share a video on your Facebook page, I would share the same on our platform. Then there was this troll who decided to come up in arms for a 10 year old. And he was even using F words. Hmm. Before, before it go to that point, the first thing he said is, it's 2020. You guys need to stop this nonsense. And I'm asking him, do you struggle? Do you have hyperhidrosis? Let's start from there. Yes, I have. Why are you saying this? Why are you using such remarks? Why are you telling me, because you're directing it to me first. Why are you telling me to stop advocating for hyperhidrosis yet you have the same condition? The same thing, it's an, an issue. I think you guys are just paranoid, that's why you sweat. And then now, I went direct and I told him, look, based on your, based on your reply, I don't think you have hyperhidrosis. You're just here to hate. Then now he decided, you know, let me channel, let me channel my frustration on a 10 year old post. Mm -hmm. A grown man using F words on a 10 year old. I just blocked him. That's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> because there's no point. Why would I go back and forth with you right. on a condition that you claim you have, but you're out here fighting hyperhidrosis awareness, you should even join me. That's what I told him even before I blocked him. I told him, if you really do have hyperhidrosis, then join hyperhidrosis awareness Kenya, work with me. Together, let's form a united front and let us advocate for hyperhidrosis. Let us reach out to those who are out there who don't know what they're dealing with. But he went back to his... Uh, F words and other words, but I blocked him. I blocked him because it didn't make sense for me to see a grown man lashing insults on a 10 year old video. Jess, 
is advocating for hyperhidrosis, hyperhidrosis at her age, something that I never did. Why would you show up? Man, just that I can't also, <laughs> just that I can't uh, use some other words, but that's how I feel. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to cut the, you know what, out of him, but I was like, you know, I can't play, I can't use the same energy that he's using. Right. You don't play on the same energy that someone else is bringing into your life, into your advocacy. I get trolled every day. I won't lie. It's a blessing when I wake up in the morning and I go on Facebook, on our Facebook page, and uh, all I get is uh, positive reviews, and a vast majority just want, uh, just negative. Well, and Martin, we talked mm -hmm. about this briefly after our last um, meaning about the cultural and society stigmas mm. surrounding sweat and that could be something we could talk about in the future as well and I would imagine like I think growing up I feel like guys maybe were more acceptable to be sweaty than women are but or even to talk about it because guys are always sweaty I guess I don't know <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah I think that would be an interesting topic to talk about like the cultural and societal stigmas are around sweat and that may be what was motivating this person you know to be maybe more hesitant about someone else advocating about hyperhidrosis mm -hmm. but one thing i've learned uh trolls trolls they just they admire what you do they admire you they admire the strength you put in and at the back of their mind, they know they will never do what you do. And since they can't rise to that level, the best thing will be, let me put Kristen down, let me put Maria down, then I'll feel good about myself. But anytime they try to knock you up and you rise up again, it becomes a challenge for them. So they have to keep up with you. But at the end of the day, my goal and everything is set on hyperhidrosis advocacy. You can troll me all you want. You can say whatever it is you want. Nowadays, I don't reply. As a matter of fact, I tell them, thank you. You took time <laughs> to read our <laughs> post. <laughs> you took time to watch our YouTube uh, videos. Oh, thank you very much. And we welcome you again and again. We need you. Why don't you just cross over and join us? <laughs> we, can, we can flip the hate to love, you know. Yeah. From uh, you're in Den you're in Denver, Maria, Maria, Maria yes. in Denver, and Kristen, uh, you're in uh, California. Yes. Now, is there a law that has been lobbied by patient advocates for people living with hyperhidrosis, and still on the same, is there a law protecting? people living with hyperhidrosis in terms of uh, treatments because they are treatments which they end up causing more harm than solutions. Are there laws? Start with Maria. Uh, laws, not that I'm aware of. Um, I do know that AT&T as a company has recognized hyperhidrosis as a disability. So if you work for AT&T, um, it's easier to get accommodations, um, you know, like a fan for your desk or a cooler office environment or a plastic cover for your computer keyboard, things like that. Um, I would love to see more regulation around ETS surgery, endoscopic transthoracic sympathectomy. That's a, a treatment for hyperhidrosis. Uh, a lot of people tout it as a cure. It's not a cure in my opinion. There are devastating side effects like compensatory sweating. So people will have the surgery to stop sweating in one area of the body and then they get compensatory sweating that's twice as bad as the original problem and makes their quality of life horrible. So I personally will never have the ETS surgery and I think there needs to be more regulation around that. Kristen? Yeah, I don't know of any laws per se that are in place, but I agree with Maria in... Um, goes back to research. Um, a lot of people who have had the surgery, the ETS surgery, do not see the compensatory sweating or adverse side effects till five and even 10 years later. So 
I actually recently read an article or research article talking about um, the effectiveness of a certain way that they do the procedure and how like 85% or 95, I forget the number, but it was a high amount of people who reduce sweating significantly, but that was only measured a year out. Um, and they also, you know, surveyed them on, you know, how they felt the experience was and did they experience reduced sweating, all that stuff. And it was very positive a year out. Um, but I think there does definitely need to be a follow-up down the road because obviously you're clipping a part of the nervous system that doesn't just control sweating. It controls a lot of things. So I agree with Maria, more regulation um, and responsibility in terms of providing treatment that may be more detrimental for patients. How can we bring hyperhidrosis advocates together? How can we do that? Start with uh, Kristen, start with you. Okay. Uh, I think doing stuff like we're doing now, and I think social media is a great, makes it way easier to connect with people all across the world and to share, you know, your interest in collaborating with each other and sharing our experiences and our stories. We all have very different experiences and stories to share. Um, I've learned so much from both of you guys already. Um, so I think just, you know, reaching out to those people who may have more information, a different perspective, different backgrounds, that's how we, we get that message out there. Maria? I agree with Kristen. Um, Definitely since COVID-19 has happened, just kind of pivoting our content strategy and going more digital versus in person. Um, you know, three years ago, we had the first ever patient-focused drug development meeting for hydrosis. That was an amazing experience to get over 100 people in the same room who are all suffering from hydrosis. So building that web of awareness really first, and then once it's safer to do so, I would love to do in-person meetups. You know, I'll stand up on stage and talk speaking because shocker it makes me sweat <laughs> but I am willing to stand up on stage and sweat you know if it helps other people let us talk about partnerships um, how does one qualify for partnerships or what's the procedure Maria you've been there for 10 years you're a wealth of yeah <laughs> Um, I don't think there's any one process or procedure. Um, <clears throat> it's just a matter of building uh, relationships with people within companies and organizations and then, you know, pitching companies. I've pitched companies. I've cold called companies like Carpe and said, hey, you know, I want to work with you guys. I think you have a product that, you know, is effective for, for me at least. Um, you know, what can we do together? And a lot of times companies are, you know, they're just starting out, they're very small and they need help advertising and growing their reach. So, you know, together we can always do more. So it's just a matter of find, seeking out the, finding the right people to contact at those companies and, and pitching them. You know, you don't have to have a per perfect pitch deck, you know, just send an email or pick up the phone or send a DM on Instagram and, and just see where it goes from there. You know, you can't, there's no right way or wrong way to do this. So just, just keep trying. And you know, before I get to you, Kristen, Maria, I'm willing, actually, I want to do a, a Zoom video with uh, the Cape brothers. If you can connect me with them, it would be, it would be an honor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because their product, <clears throat> I brought Cape in uh, 2019, last year. Of course, there were Kenyans who are using Cape. Um, there are those who will buy online, and there are those who have relatives in different states in the U.S. So whenever they would visit, they will bring a carpet to them. So there are those who are, um, they were introduced to topical treatments earlier than most of us. But when I introduced carpet last year, I saw some amazing reviews from Kenyans using carpet, since it works well with people with mild sweat. <laughs> For those who have uh, mild uh, sweat on their palms, armpits, and, and other areas, they were satisfied with carpet. And I noticed the number still requesting for carpet, so I would love to talk to them. Uh, you can connect me. I know yes, you can. yes, I will. Because you did last year. You're the one who, 
You see, I've been telling you, you're the bridge. You're connecting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Kristen. Yes. Your take. How can we bring? How can we bring? How can we bring? No, not advocacy. Sorry, partnership. <laughs> I'm also lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've noticed um, reaching out to those small businesses, mm. and especially during COVID, but especially for hyperhidrosis, there's a lot of smaller starting companies that are trying to get their product out there, and like Maria, I won't advertise something that I haven't tried that doesn't, that works for me, um, that, or that doesn't work for me. So I think, you know, just sharing the importance that although we do have a small group, they are very engaged and making that more accessible. So I also uh, have a small partnership with Carpe and I've worked, or I've talked with one of the chemists regarding their product and so just getting to know a little bit more about the products as well understanding how they're made um i think is important because a lot of people you know especially in treatment want to avoid aluminum or different things like that um so just bring more education and and uh that information um to people that are that are following and listening from my end uh I know you follow my, you follow our Instagram page and you've seen different brands from Cafe, Sweat Block, Degree, and all these, all these other brands. The reason why we give people options, they are Kenyans who have their own products, go-to products. For instance, I have about five who prefer Degree because it has worked for them from the onset. There are those who prefer Cafe. There are those who prefer Sweat Block. So whenever I'm talking of topical treatments, there are those who ask, between now sweat block and cafe, which one do you think will wipe everything that will wipe my sweat away? So this is where now the, you know, managing versus cure comes in. It's not curing, it's going to help you manage. But in terms of products, I cannot tell you that this product is better than this other product. Why? Because two people, two different people can use the same product and get different results. Mm -hmm. Those who have identified their products, I cater for them. Those who haven't, I encourage them to try. That's what I do. For the first time I used Cape, Cape worked well for me, uh, for my armpits. It worked well for my armpits as compared to my palms. So I had to look for a different brand for my palms. You see, I didn't disregard uh, Cape, that Cape is not working. It worked on one focal area better than the other. So as HAK, I want to give people, or we want to give people solutions, different brands that they can try. But these are not just any brands, these are brands that have been used. And there are people who can testify their testimonies out there on the results and how it has worked for them. So, um, which brings me to this other point. When are we going to have hyperhidrosis awareness conference? <laughs> we need money <laughs> to do that, <laughs> depending on how big we want to go, at, at least. Start accepting those uh, feet offerings. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Fund our hyperhidrosis <laughs> But now since, now since we are communicating virtually, I had this conversation with Maria. We can take advantage of November. November is the International Hyperhidrosis Awareness Month, right? We can have our own conference. We can do it. Mm -hmm. There are no travel restrictions. All you need is internet. <laughs> right. And your presence. And yeah. invite as many as you can. And let us have our own, let us now have that discussion. Let people talk about their sweat. You won't even, you don't, you don't have to dress for the occasion. You can wear your light uh, colored t-shirt. You can show your sweat patches because now this is one happy family where we don't judge. We're just expressing ourselves. I believe it's positive. By the way, I have a- No, I think, that'd be, I think that would be great. Yeah, yeah. 
I have a cycling event on November 6th. Yeah, it's been keeping me uh, late because I have to plan for it. I'm communicating with some, some of my crew. Yeah, November 6th, we have a cycling event for hyperhidrosis awareness. After which now, from 6th is when now we can decide on a day where we can have that conference and we invite as many as we can. Just bring people on board. And we can, I can join in on the cycling too. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I cycle too. I think that would be fun to do like a, maybe like a Zoom or a FaceTime just introducing, you know, wherever I start. I don't know. We could talk about that, but that would be fun to do like a, a cycling, you know, thing, join you guys on November 6th. Of course we can, I can work on that. It's very workable. And Maria, when are you going to join us on a cycling event? <laughs> well, I have a bike too. I have a beach cruiser, so I don't have like an actual like nice cycling bike, but I can ride around on the street for a little while on November 6th. You know what, down the line, there will come a time when I'll bring this awareness to the US, I will. I can bring it to two different states. I can bring it to Denver <laughs> and California. And then we can there you decide, go. we can map and decide which area is best for cycling and we do it. And we invite as many as we can. Those who will be available, those are the people we go with. Mm -hmm. So we can work on the hyperhidrosis awareness conference. That that we can. In fact, I'll throw that duty to Kristen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's your duty now. You plan for it. Conference? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Give us the well, I mean, you guys will obviously like be helping, but yeah, okay. <laughs> of course, of course. We, we won't we won't let you uh do all the work by yourself. We are <laughs> you. <laughs> but you're the sure. team leader, you're the one uh leading the conference. So yeah, now you have you have you have work to do. I have homework. No, you have homework to do. And Maria <laughs> is the principal, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you need any clarification, you go to her. <laughs> She's going to help us a lot. Maria, by the way, thank you very much for the, the 10 years are not in vain. I wouldn't thank have, you. I wouldn't have pushed hyperhidrosis awareness Kenya to where it is, if not for your creativity, your writing. Oh, thank you. I've read those stories and man, People from the Navy, Jess, all these people, these are, these are normal people. And we live in the mm -hmm. same planet. They are not from planet Mars. They are from the same planet. Right. You've written stories from professionals. I've read a lot. I've, I've read all those stories. And I, I would sit down with my pen and paper. I didn't even care whether I was, going, I was going to smudge, whatever it is. The sweat paddles will just flow with me. I'll just take notes. Mm -hmm. I'll compare, I'll, I'll look. There are those important, uh, what do they call it? There are those important notes. How can I equate it to, uh, what's, it, what's, an, what's the equivalent of a sound bite when it comes to the notes, the not thin? What's the equivalent? I don't know. Apparently, um. Just like a, like a highlight, you mean? Exactly, highlights. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take the most important highlights and they will give me a whole entire picture, a whole movie. I don't see content, I see movies. That, that's me. That's how I, mm -hmm. I see movies. So I'll sit down and allow everything to play. And that is what made me push hyperhidrosis awareness right here in Kenya and take it a notch higher, including my expertise as a creative, everything, but just to push it to the next level. I wouldn't have done it without your amazing stories that you write. You write about life. Those are not stories. You write about life. Yeah. When you do something out of your heart and soul, when you write about life, someone else will love it. Someone else who align everything about them with whatever you're giving them. 
And the most mm -hmm. important thing is that you lead with your life. You have hyperhidrosis. So you're not writing things you don't know. Right. All your experience and everything is aligned. So those are not stories you write about life. And thank you very much for, for that. Thank, thank you. I'm, it makes me so happy to know that I've inspired you. I, I appreciate that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Kristen? By the way, how many years have you been advocating for hyperhidrosis? Since April of this year. April of this year. <laughs> Include now your life and all the experiences you've been in. You've been right. advocating for hyperhidrosis your whole entire life until you decided to now share your life with the world, right? I follow you on Instagram. And there are those small videos you have of you playing golf. <laughs> Oh You're talking I've about flown uh, into the golf course, but like just flown away before. So. <laughs> I do. I do read those Insta stories that you post. Uh, I read some of them. I watch those videos, and I see someone who's full of life, someone who's taking this advocacy, and she also includes her life and her experiences. She's not just talking about sweat. She's living, she's a living proof that even with this condition, you can still achieve in life. And so Kristen is really funny too. So if you guys <laughs> haven't started following Kristen yet, she's <laughs> hilarious. So, and that's, that's another neat thing about being a hyperhidrosis advocate. Each one of us has something different to offer and we'll say, we could say the same thing, but in a different way. So I really appreciate Kristen's humor with all of this because I try not to take myself too seriously so <laughs> she will talk about it sometimes she'll even pick her nose i mean it's awesome <laughs> <Yeah. Shoot. laughs> we, we, at the end of the day as, as human you have to be as human as possible we can't all be all strict and that's why all my zoom videos have to be very interactive this is not fox news or cnn welcome to uh, fox news we are here talking about <laughs> we cannot be serious all the time I want someone right. else to relate. You know, right. when they see me, when they see me talk about hyperhidrosis in Kenya, sometimes I'm fumbling. <laughs> right. These are three people having that one conversation that a lot of people are still holding back. But uh, yeah, thank you for the wonderful work that the two of you are doing. And uh, with time, with time, this, this whole advocacy that we're doing will pay off. The 10 years are not in vain. Right. Uh, the, since April of this year is not in vain. <laughs> the three years that I've been advocating is not in vain. If, if I didn't start Hyperhidrosis Awareness Kenya, I would never have met you, Maria, or Kristen via Zoom, never. Right. So this means that what lies ahead is far much bigger than we think. And we are the people to change. We are, we are changing, the, we are, we are changing the, the, we are shaping the conversation, changing the landscape. We are the ones who are going to bring the revolution. So thank you guys, thank you guys. Um, what do you expect going forward? I'll start with uh, our OG in the game. <laughs> going forward. Um, going forward, I think <clears throat> I would like to just see younger people get, get more involved so that they can um, feel accepted and feel like they have a community of support from childhood all the way through adulthood. Um, and just, you know, growing the advocacy pod, if you will, um, and, and getting more advocates on board so that we can build something bigger. Kristen? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the important thing is that some of us who have primary have been dealing with this our entire lives. And as you mentioned earlier, Martin, when you bundle all those things up, you know, over time, it obviously it'll carry into adulthood. So if anything, making, you know, those young people aware and giving them that voice to talk about it so that they don't have to carry anything into adulthood. Um, and just have be more prepared and have more support that maybe we didn't have. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, creating 
you know, collaboration with each other and uh, just doing what you guys are doing. I mean, I think it's, it's still great. And like she said, just creating a foundation for something for the future. Well, um, what would be your last one? Kristen, you go first. <laughs> no, <not> I, <laughs> I want to thank Martin because you're like the driving force in all these Zoom meetings and your creativity, you know, doesn't go unnoticed. Like you started, you know, these, these meetings with us and interviewing us. And I love to hear from you as well and your ideas and your cycling thing. I love it. I think it's all great. Um, and I would like to see, you know, the stuff that we're talking about now just being more accessible to everybody and worldwide. And, and I think those challenges are something we'd have to work with together because in even different states, there's different regulations and different rules. And so working through that, but my last word, <laughs> paragraph, I guess, um, <laughs> would just be, I'm just thankful for, you know, you guys and what you do. And I know that you guys put your whole heart into it and it shows and just very grateful to be a part of it. You're welcome. Maria. I would echo what Kristen said, you know, thank you, Martin, for organizing all of these Zoom meetings. It's been really great. Um, I guess I would just want people to know that, you know, there's nothing wrong with you per se. You know, if you have primary hyperhidrosis and you were born with this, it is what it is, but don't give up hope because that hopefully one day there will be a cure. And right now there are a lot of treatments out there that do work some of the time at least. Um, you know, this is a condition that affects 365 million people. That's 5% of the global population. So you are not alone. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help and use your sweaty voice. Don't be afraid to ask for what you need in order to live a better life. My last word to the advocates, starting with the two distinguished advocates and those who are going to watch this video. If you want to advocate for hyperhidrosis, don't do it for popularity. Serve people with your life, they will accept you, and they're going to reciprocate. Serve with your life. For us, Maria has been doing it for 10 years. We don't have a million followers. We may have 120 subscribers on our YouTube channels, but that doesn't deter us from advocating for hyperhidrosis. If a story is in a different county, we'll go for that story. We'll produce it, we'll upload and release because there is someone, there is someone who's waiting on your story just to sit down and listen to, you know, <clears throat> the flow of it. You're born with it, these are the challenges you went through, and this is where you are in life. Your story is someone else's strength. We have to keep on pushing for advocacy. We have to keep on pushing for these stories. The conversation, I keep saying, shape the conversation. If you're going to do it to be popular, you won't last long. That curve will hit a plateau, and you know what happens when you hit plateau. The next thing, you go back to zero. Don't do it for popularity. Do it to serve the hyperhidrosis community, the hyperhidrosis family. You have to use your voice to change someone else's life. You have the power to make them, you have to, your voice will influence them to change. You cannot change them, but your voice will influence them to change. Serve with your life. Push ego to the side. This is not a hip hop channel where people beef over anything and everything. I don't, five or 10 years from now that we are beefing, someone else is calling themselves the king of Amma, um, the queen of sweat. We can't afford to have such. That's why I want advocates. I want all of us to come together. I'm looking at Maria, I'm looking at 10 years of experience. I'm looking at Kristen and I'm looking at wealth of experience. 
you might think what Martin is doing is great. Martin is also looking at someone else who's advocating for hyperhidrosis and it's like, I wish I can have the strength to do what they're doing. Which means we all have to come together and consolidate our strength and take this awareness to the next level. And with those few words, thank you very much, Maria. Thank, thank you, you very, for having me. Thank you very much, Kristen. Thank you, Martin. And we know we are coming back in November for the hyperhidrosis <laughs> awareness. In case you forgot, you have a duty. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> Thank you, guys, and uh, enjoy your, is it afternoon or morning? Still morning for me. But. Yeah, it's almost lunchtime here, so. Yeah. I guess today I'm lucky it's 8.30 p.m. I'm lucky today. Lucky Maybe you'll go to bed early tonight. <laughs> I think so. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Kristen. Nice to Bye, see your Kristen. face. Bye-bye, <laughs> guys. Bye. Bye.